Good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well and keeping cool in this warm weather. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Lisa Reyna. I'm the Livestock Project Officer for StockSense, and I'm going to be your host and facilitator. Um, if you haven't met me in the first webinar, hey there. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land at which we are gathered this evening, wherever you may be. Um, I wish to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and community. And I think it's pretty particularly relevant for this webinar um, because I guess when we gain new land, we become custodians of land which we might have inherited cultural importance and that might be something really particular for the indigenous community. And I think Malcolm, you have a story about this later on. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm from Wurundjeri country, so uh, woman Jekka in the Woi Wurrung language. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, I think last week, just due to, the ba to people had plans and the bad weather and the storms that were happening across Victoria, we had a lot of emails come in about whether the recording was going to be available. So just to let everyone know that on Friday afternoon, the recording of this session, any links and resources and any information or material that is going to be available or we'll be referencing for next week, we'll be sending out to everyone who registers um, on that Friday afternoon. So if you don't, if you can't make it, don't worry, you'll have access to these sessions. Um, if you haven't received it by that point, shoot us the, an email at stocksense at vff.org.au and we'll add you to the attendees list. Survey time. Um, if you could take the next minute or two to scan the QR code, that would be awesome. Um, it just ensures that we're hitting the mark. I think a few people have done it previously, but if you haven't, now's a great time. Um, if you've already done it, go grab a glass of water or uh, grab a notepad and pen like I do. Um, but also uh, the first question mentions um, what part, part of Victoria you're from. And we specifically talk about catchment management authorities because part of our funding structure is that we cover each of those catchment management th authority areas. And we actually collaborate a lot with the CMAs across Victoria. Um, they're a great resource to have. They usually have a lot of projects going on. They usually have grants or to maintain biodiversity or help you plant trees or do some sort of environmental land management. Um, and a project that I actually recently found out about for, that the Karangamite CMA is doing is called Small Blocks, Big Dreams. So if you're down in the Karangamite area, you can, they, it's basically is a project, project specifically targeted for small landholders in the area. It's for it's paired with land care and it's basically teaching people how to best manage their property in terms of um, best practice land management, environmental ma land management. Um, and they have a specific series targeted for livestock owners. So I will add that into the resource section, pluggy plug plug, because they're just a great resource to have and it's free. So why not access it? Um, if everyone's completed or scanned it, awesome. I will pass it on to Malcolm, who's going to present for our second webinar series. So farm layout and what infrastructure you need. So take it away, Malcolm. Thanks, Lisa. Yep. Okay. Uh, for this webinar, I'm presenting and my name's Malcolm Cock. And I am call myself a lucky farmer because I'm still alive, enjoying life. And I've had plenty of opportunities throughout my career to learn from my mistakes. So, um, and I've survived them, so that's great. And now that's a bit about me, the next one. Next slide, thanks, Lisa. Uh, yep, it's, um, yep, it's all parts of farming. It's a great family um, lifestyle in most cases, and it's, um, it's people that go into farming not to make money necessarily. You have to make money to survive, but uh, really enjoy the lifestyle. Okay, next one. Thanks. Yeah, that's a bit about me. As I said, I'm a lucky farmer or a lucky farmer. And the next slide. Thanks, Lisa. Now, uh, last year, I always like to do a review um, of what, what's happened. And the last webinar, we looked at planning and finding out what people wanted to do and the process of doing that and getting it down on paper is very important. 
And then the other section of it was basically about working out what you've got to work with, assessing if identifying your farm features and assessing them and, uh, and by doing a SWOT. So that's what we're working on. Okay, next one. Thanks, Lisa. Now, the journey, as I see it, putting in a nutshell, is the three watts and then the actions to go with those watts. Uh, what is wanted? We did last time. What is last time? And this one is about what can be. Okay, and the actions you can do about it. Now, uh, if it has been sent already, there is a sample plan um, report that I did for clients that um, will uh, follow that journey sort of thing. Um, anyway, that's some reading that you might find helpful. Okay, now, when you're doing your planning and when you're doing the actions, please keep uh, these key principles in mind. Plan and enjoy the farming lifestyle, keeping it simple, safe and simple. Keep the learning curve steep and get help and manage the money. Okay. Um, developing the farm infrastructure according to your plans, resources and farm environment. So you take those three things into consideration as well as those principles. Thanks, please. Okay, now what we're covering this webinar, once again, we look at the resources for actually getting your farm developed or laying it out and designing the farm layout, natural features, the infrastructure and the handy tool of maps and other considerations when you're planning your farm layout. And that includes... Um, how you put infrastructure and so forth and to manage your risks and things like your pastures, how do you manage your pastures best? So we're looking at the infrastructure that goes into doing those things as well. Lisa? What do you have to work with? Well, we've gone through the people aspects, but I would like to put in um, add additions to that um, I haven't included there is previous owners a really good source if you've got still have contact with those neighbors uh, those sorry the previous uh, owners and if you're thinking of buying a property make sure you get as much information out of those previous owners as can and um, and so they are a very good source you know such as have they got a map of the water system they can save a lot of headaches. And other, um, your local groups such as land care uh, are a really big asset for not only information but support. Um, I can't stress how useful and it's really good to have those people. And you've got Agricultural Victoria, you've got CMAs, as Lisa mentioned, MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia, and Shires quite often have a agricultural person employed to help um, farmers in the area, particularly um, the ones on the edge of um, Melbourne, for example. They, I know my local Shire has a agricultural person. Okay, now uh, you've got your service personnel. We've covered on most of those are self-explanatory, but rural stores, just remember they're selling you stuff. I do recommend that you uh, tally up, uh, list all the stuff that you need for a year, such as trenches, uh, fencing equipment or whatever it may be, and so that you go to them and ask them for a quote for a big order. As if you're a hobby, a small farmer, um, it's hard to get a discount, but if you go in with a bigger order, uh, you quite often get a discount. And I suggest you, you know, try a couple of different shop uh, stores to um, try for different quotes. Okay. Uh, now, transport. Um, I suggest uh, getting a trailer for um, picking up 
hay or picking up equipment or whatever it may be, six by four or nine by five. Nine by fives as big as I like to have because some of the roads are narrow and that follows on well behind your vehicle, a nine by five, but you go any bigger and they become unwieldy. Um, and particularly, I do not recommend transporting stock in a trailer. I have done a lot of it, and I mean a lot, and I've had a lot of very near misses. I, as I said, I'm a lucky farmer. I've tipped over trailers and vehicles and um, have even had one bull um, killed. In it. So I do not recommend it at all. It's a specialist job. Um, education, there's plenty of there's TAFEs around, there's plenty of uh, courses uh, to get more knowledge, including agricultural diplomas, etc. And if you've got a farm to actually um, practice think some of the theory, it's a, it's a good way to go. Okay, money, we talked about that last webinar. you just got to manage it. And don't overcapitalize and don't undercapitalize. So, okay. Now, machinery, this is an interesting one. Um, to develop and um, four wheel drive tractors and front and loaders. And I suggest that you do get a four in one bucket with your front and loader and get a tractor that um, is big enough, say a 55 or 70 horsepower tractor that's big enough to handle big round bales. Um, with uh, forks on the front as well. Um, it's good for feeding out and transporting. Now, um, four-wheel drives are much safer than two-wheel drives, and they've got cabins on them uh, quite often. You don't have to necessarily have a cabin because you're not going to be using it a lot necessarily, as long as it's got the roll cage, which is illegal. Now, the ATVs, um, all-terrain vehicle, that's a four four wheeler with a roll cage on it. It's not a um, I do recommend those, or you can get a little Suzuki Ute, um, but um, I do not recommend quads. They are extremely dangerous, and I've never recommended quads. Um, but the ATV, they're not cheap, but they they're very very handy. Now, a piece of equipment um, is an inverter and um, inverter ch uh, generator, which is a really handy backup for blackouts and stuff like that. Um, and uh, particularly, you know, if you've got electric water pumps and so forth, you can put the make sure it's big enough to run the the pumps. Okay. Um, now, if you could put in the chat section please if you can think of anything else that's essential for um, managing your farm and developing it i appreciate that if you could and if uh, lisa if you're able to read them out if people are putting those in yep will do thanks and uh, we've got tools then now you've got electronic mechanical and s safety equipment uh, phone is a, a very handy tool um, for communication, for safety factors. If you're out on the farm, you've got it with you. If you have an accident or you get bogged or you get stuck or you've a service provider has come on and trying to find you, you can um, use it for those sort of things Um it's just check the where you get reception on your farm and where you don't. Okay, um, computer, of course, you can't do without a computer nowadays, it seems, but your phone can act also as a computer. Um, they are monitoring systems. Your monitoring systems um, can be for visual monitoring to see who's coming onto the place at the front entrance. Um, you can have it at your sheds to see, make sure there's um, no funny business going on around the sheds. You can have it at the stockyards if you need to um, 
well, uh, t sorry, in your quarantine area, if you're checking out a sick animal or something like that, you can use it for that. And a very important one, particularly for absentee farmers, would be uh, monitoring on your water system, your water storage, and making sure that um, they're freely, well, they're not freely available. They do cost money, but they're well worthwhile having. And it's all connected. I have a mentee that was doing a PhD on actually in Queensland, uh, and she's doing working with Telstra on you can monitor a cow when she's calving from satellite onto your phone to see whether or not she's having trouble. That's something uh, blows your mind, really. Um, so monitoring systems are great. Uh, fencing, fencing tools for maintenance and or uh, building your own fences, if you know how. Uh, water, and water system tools for repairs. You want to make sure they're readily available and you've got the right tools for the right equipment. And that goes with the spare parts. Make sure you've got the right fittings for the size pipe and so forth you're putting in or you're maintaining. Okay, every uh, farm seems to need to have a chainsaw. And particularly if you're living along a road that's narrow and there's trees on both sides, um, quite often uh, a lot of farmers have keep the chainsaw in a boot so they can get out. And particularly at fire time, you know, if it's a fire uh, somewhere nearby, yes, you definitely want to have that in your boot as you go to make sure um, if you've got time to cut trees off the road. Okay, um, but make sure once again the safe you've got safety equipment for the chainsaw. You've done a course for safe using co uh, chainsaws, and of course wear that safety equipment and uh, be very careful. They are a nasty weapon. I had a brother that nearly cut his hand off, except for a steel watch saved him from that. Um, power tools, there's plenty of those, a good variety nowadays. And if anyone's got any other suggestions, uh, please put it in your chat room. Have yep. we got any? Yeah, any... we do. Right. There's um water pump for fire, so like a mobile water pump. Yep, good one. Uh, float for taking animals to the vet. So I guess if not, trans I guess if you need to transport them in the an emergency. Um, I would not suggest that, um, except for, for horses. Okay. Or animal, so or animal, or alpacas, fine. Sheep are fine. But for cattle, not so much? Not, not cattle so much, no. Um, I have transported one. I can speak from experience. I've put a bull into it one, uh, and it was not good for the uh, thing or me. <laughs> but... Um, for the sorry for the horse float yep um so, i don't recommend it um so the it, option we're trying to get a call out vet or use phone a vet to try and get someone to to diagnose it on the farm it's always best to get the vet to come to cattle yes definitely um for one it's less stress on the animal the status that's amazing yep. for welfare, welfare for the animal um and then you've also got to get them on to the trailer and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have picked up uh, uh, animals um, on a buck rack on the back of a, a tractor before, um, or I've had forklifts on, um, with a pallet to put them on okay. and to bring them up to the sheds. Someone also mentioned chemical management equipment or spraying equipment. Safety wise, definitely. If you're going to be using chemicals, you want the safety masks and um, overalls, etc., goggles and gloves, and um, a safety chemical. But I'll come into that one later on. Yep. Uh, we've got trickle battery charger for the generator, so it's ready when you need it. Uh, yes. Uh, good to have a generator. If you've got a battery one, if you've got a big gen generator. Um, Myself, I've got a two kilowatt one, uh, it's inverter, and it 
it's fantastic for blackouts, but it does my small pumps. It doesn't do the big pumps. Yep. Uh, um, a, lot, a lot of dairy farms now have big generators. It, that's I been a big change in the last 10 years because uh, cows have to be milked, and if your um, electricity is not working, you've got problems. So. Yep. And I think the last one is a welder. A welder, yes, if you've got the skill and the safety equipment for those, of course. Um, yes, I, I did a welding course at a tech, um, and yes, very handy from that point of view, tools. And we're just, we're just one, someone wanted clarification what you meant by ATV. So you mean side, so another word for it is a side-by-side? -side? Correct, yeah. Yep. So something with a roll cage, so just in case you, you know, yeah. and, and get into an belts. And seat belts. Gotcha, yep. cool. Beautiful. Um, it doesn't mean you won't have an accident with it. <laughs> we used to have a little Suzuki, uh, Super Suzy, and my kid, <laughs> my three kids learnt on that. But uh, only hearing once they left home, only hearing some of the accidents they nearly had <laughs> or, or did have. <laughs> they didn't tell me about, but um, it was a manual, and they uh, yeah, uh, they learnt to drive well on that. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, Thank you for all the uh, answers in the chat box. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Okay, now setting up your farm uh, considerations. Uh, the maps are, are tools for helping to set the, this up clearly. But um, okay, and then there's all the different features, water, soil, vegetation, pasture. And you've got to consider the climate. Um, and then, of course, you've got the infrastructure, the built infrastructure, and the infrastructure's suitability for the stock and the stock's suitability for the, the farm itself and the infrastructure. Okay, uh, and, of course, the risks, setting up the farm with the risks in mind. Okay, now, uh, Google Maps, uh, Google Earth Pro is a fantastic uh, mapping program. It's free and you just got to learn to use it well. And there's things I haven't learned to use on that yet. Uh, but yeah, so if you're good at learning things, new things on computer, this is very handy and you'll get to know your farm a lot better. Okay. Thanks. Next one. Okay. What do you have to work with um, as regards setting up your farm? Okay, uh, the farm map we're talking about now, it's a useful tool, as we said before, built uh, doing your natural and your built characteristics. Okay, now we I use it for planning development, such as uh, you can measure how big your paddocks are, you can measure how, how long the fence is, so you can order materials for it. Um, so there's plenty of things you can do with the maps. Um, now, farm and stock management, um, you can make maps for the soil. Now you can make it for different um, stocking mobs and grazing management. In other words, you can do feed budgets. Um, it's handy. And from that point of view, um, it's also you increase your number of paddocks so that you can have a, a better rotation of with your grazing uh, and I found a very handy one of uh, printing out a plain one for um, service providers uh, so that they know where to go and so forth um, it's very handy from that point of view uh, now biosecurity and other records so that um, if you've got a spraying campaign on, if you're spraying weeds or something like that, you've got to have a withholding period in that paddock and you can identify that paddock easily. You can put them where you've got withholding paddocks, say, colour in, whatever it may be. Okay, uh, natural features. Um, the natural features which you put on a map are water, soil, topography and vegetation, biosecurity, features, uh, rocks, historical, there may be historical, I know one client, he had a, a broken down rock wall, it was only about a foot high I think, 
uh, but it was had some historical value and it had been listed in historical value. So um, you can get into trouble if you go and get the front loader and pack all those rocks up, that sort of thing. Uh, so you've got to be on aware of that, but you can put that on the maps. Uh, in culture, there's a photograph there of um, Buchan, uh, of our property. Um, it was an Aboriginal cave there, or it is an Aboriginal cave there. And it's been classified as a very important aspect as regards the heritage, cultural, cultural site. Um, and uh, we've we looked after the place, trying to keep the weeds down. Um, it's a whole big cliff face along there. It's, the cliff face has also got a huge uh, fault in it, uh, from uplifting from uh, times ancient times. But the cave. It's got a big gate on it. Uh, we got, uh, just before we sold the, the home club farm, we got a letter from a government department um, saying that they were compulsory acquiring five acres around the Aboriginal cave, which um, in 2,000 acres that didn't, didn't worry us. We were quite happy to do that. We, we thought it was a sacred place and uh, needed to be looked after. So they acquired it. Just be, you know, you need to be aware of these things when you're buying a property and or managing property because there may be um, cultural sites that are, are found on your farm, as Lisa said earlier. Okay, there's other management considerations such as um, grazing production. You may be wanting to put in a, an orchard somewhere so you uh, can use your map where's the best place to put those. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Liz. Okay, infrastructure we talked about. Um, so there's the, the good old water again, but that's dams. Uh, this is built infrastructure. So that's dams, tanks, pipes, troughs. Uh, the fences, you've got your boundary internal and your laneways. Uh, sheds, you've got feed sheds, machinery, and you can have a pump shed. If you've got a pump down by a dam or river or something like that, just watch out for pumps uh, for floods. Um, and stockyards uh, and containment areas. Uh, quarantine containment areas are extremely valuable. Um, access tracks dry and your front driveway, as well as your laneways. Uh, homestead and power... Um, Utilities, we'll be looking into those on the way we go. Okay, Lisa. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Now, constructing farm maps. Uh, as we mentioned before, there's Google Maps, Earth Maps, Google Earth Pro. Farming uh, mapping software, there's a number of software packages out that you can buy, and they have maintenance programs with those. They're not cheap, but they can be extremely handy. Um, you can have a spreadsheet, of course, for um, keeping data on as well. Um, I used to do feed budgeting with um, spreadsheets. Uh, okay, now there's also Lands uh, Victoria, the Department of Lands. You, it's a very good um, mapping program for contours and other features on your farm, such as fire areas and so forth uh put all um yeah put them all on the maps um now the water sources we've gone through that a uh, number of paddocks uh, now this is a, a very handy but a very simple thing to do and that is put your numbers of your paddocks i put them in clockwise order as best i can that's number of the pa each paddock and put that number with a big yellow ear tag, max ear tag, tech screwed onto a wooden post or uh, onto a steel gateway or the gate post as you're going into the paddock. So when you're giving a service provider, you know, like a fertilizer truck, uh, a map to all the paddocks that want to be done, it's less likely to make a mistake. And print off that A4 copy and give it to him. 
Uh, now, when you develop your map on your computer, I do suggest very strongly that you go out um, and fine tune that map on site. So go right around the farm and make sure you got things in the right place and you haven't missed things. Lisa? Okay, starting from the ground up, um, you know, quite often you can have um, a farm like this we had in the first um, webinar, virtually got nothing on it. And so Bob's your uncle. They didn't even have a dam that was worthwhile. You can see a little tiny little dot there where there's a tiny little puddle of water in the dam. So they've got no water source except for a bit of water catchment. Okay, next one. Now, a really good way of improving your um, manage, <coughs> management of your property, its pastures, stock movement and everything else, is to divide your paddocks up. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is um, according to uh, topography is a very important one. Topography, I mean by hills and flats, the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, example on that is topography, you fence off the northern sides from your southern sides the, because they behave differently than the uh, northern sides and the western sides from your eastern sides because they, um, eastern and the uh, southern sides uh, don't get as hot and dry as what your northern sides do. Uh, they will also have different pastures because of the likely to have, you should plant a different pasture species for those um, dry areas compared to southern areas um, or the wet areas. Uh, and now also soils, you need to divide that up if you can. It's only practical. I did have a quite a big paddock that had about three or four different soil types in it. And it did need um, dividing up according to those because it was also to do with the slope as well. But um, sometimes you can't do them, uh, practically do it um, because of money or time or um, it's just the, the soil types vary too much. Um, okay, rocks, of course, um, they you can't. Uh, cover the country it's harder to get um, so you might have different species in there or it's more native pasture and so forth so you want to keep rocks separate them out if you can and we've sort of mentioned the water um, access is important too that's where you um, want the laneways but you also need to be able to have be able to harvest the um, muster the stock and that's where rocks come in it's much harder to muster stocks stock off a rocky area than it is of a non-rocky area um, unless you've got really good dogs who can do it for you and it's very hard to take atvs over rocky areas and i've had a lot of experience in rocky areas um okay vegetation um, you might want to f uh, fence off all your uh, native vegetation um, into paddocks where it is um, so that you can manage it differently to your pastures. Yeah, that doesn't mean you can't graze it at certain times for a short period of time, but um, yeah, it's, they're good to cut off. And for the purpose, uh, for grazing purposes, whether you're going to have an orchard or something like that. Okay. Um, Put in your, you know, for easy, you know, put in your aimway, sorry, and your tracks and so forth for easy stock movement. You need your tracks, particularly for hilly country um, and your laneways. It's much harder to do it on hilly country, though, laneways. Uh, design water system um, and fence off all your water sources and your storage, like your tanks. You don't want stocks getting in there and busting off pipe fittings and so forth like that. Uh, but always make sure you've got a gate so that you can maintain the weeds and as a backup, if you 
for the water source. Again, okay, so if you your water system is not working for some reason or other, you can let them into a dam or into even a river if they're not going to go walking across the river to neighbours or wherever it may be. Now I've had that happen. Okay, site um, now siting your home shed, uh, homestead and sheds and your stockyards will go into that when we cover those areas. Okay, thanks, Lisa. I've just had a question come in. Yep, good. Um, they asked, is the use of a drone on your property useful? It can be. Uh, depends. It does. Uh, we've had workshops on this and. Um, Yes, if you've got a lot to do, you can go around and check your troughs, water troughs. You can check your animals once they get used to it. <laughs> they tend to run away. You can use it for muster. Um, people have been using it for mustering. Um, and that could be good for uh, rocky areas if you'd like to play with uh, toy too. But no, they, they're proving quite useful. They're not over expensive and... Um, and they they certainly got good cameras on them nowadays. And uh, no, I did put yeah that could be a useful thing, um, but not necessarily essential. But yeah, useful. Just have to look at the cost benefit, like with every other thing. Oh well, and your time factor. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, yeah, it's an important factor. Um, but for checking troughs, yeah, you want to check that. Beautiful. So people, please uh, put in um, questions as we go along. It would be great. I'd appreciate it. I'm used to workshops where we have a lot more interaction uh, for that question, you know, um, that question of um, how how long have people been farming for? Uh, I, I used to get people to get up and um, stand in a line according to their how long they've been in. You know, it's just a bit of activity rather than just listening to me drone on. Um, it uh, certainly helps. So please ask questions if you've got one, preferably to the topic we're talking to. <laughs> okay, so that farm you saw a paddock before, uh, the purple line was what was there, but uh, the red lines are what are proposed. The fence lines, cutting it up. Uh, this has got a laneway in it, but only a short one. Uh, so uh, difficult to do laneways. Now, with rocky areas, it's not a bad idea when when there's short, relatively short grass to be able to pick your way and make a track through the rocks that you can take your vehicle and stock, preferably. Um, where, how you mark those rocks, you can paint the rocks, but if... The grass grows over those, you can't see that, and you can put in posts, and then the stock love to rub on those posts. So mark them somehow or other, or get to know where they are. Uh, that's just a bit of a hint. Um, okay, next one, thanks. Okay, that's another example of a farm map. First, this is a first concept. And this couple, this is Flinders Island, um uh, wanted to build a house where they could make best view um, of the views that they had around. To the east, it was a mountain, a really nice mountain view. And to the west was the sea. Um, so we set up the plane to so that they could look through through past trees that could frame the view. Um, and also they wanted to look over water. So there was a dam there. And that's also... They've got a creek for water supply, but that may or may not be permanent. Uh, there's a few things. This is not the water supply in there, uh, suggested water supply. So that's just another example. Thanks. Now, this is uh, another example, but um, you can see, but if you look at closely and you can zoom in with this map. Um, with satellite photographs, you can see there's our existing fences and so forth, but that's what I've got to work with. But um, And if you go to the next slide, you'll be able to see on that the purple, once again, is uh, what was there as regards that. And this is proposed with lanes so that 
Yeah, the laneway was in to go to their yards. They had stockyards there, and um, I'm pointing to my screen, so that's not helping you guys. I haven't got a pointer on this one. Uh, but that's for easy stock movement, for cutting the paddocks up according to their slope and um, best. Uh, I don't like, a lot of people like to cut their paddocks up into equal sizes. To me, I you've got to do it to the other benefits uh, such as slope, um, aspect, uh, soil, etc., and uh, you can adjust your how many days grazing you've got in those paddocks to cater for that. But you can see the the numbers are clearly marked. Um, and now there's the a water system proposed water system. They didn't have one. Uh, they just had the one sole. Oh, they they've got a separate map for the water supply, and I do suggest you have a detailed a uh, different map for you, for the household uh, water supply. Uh, Malcolm, there's yes. just a question, and now you're talking about why you've split it up and the reasons for splitting up the paddock. Someone's asked, what is the biggest factor in determining paddock size, type of stock, rainfall and soil, or your block size? Uh, it's, the, it's the topography is a major one. Uh, and what um, and it's land class as well. Now land class, and we'll come on to that a bit like uh, shortly. Actually, uh, the next slide might be land class, but um, the okay. So I go on topography: the north from the south, east from the west, where you can. It makes a big difference. Uh, I, as I said, I don't go on this. Try to make even size for the mobs because you can. It's just a matter of grazing them for less time. Now, with grazing, we'll get on to the gra grazing pastures principles uh, a bit later, but the idea is basically to get them on and get them off quickly. So you want a number of paddocks so that you can have a good rotational grazing, and that allows the pastures to recuperate. Okay, but we'll be talking a bit more about that later on. But it's um, you fit it to their natural features the paddock sizes and number. And that's why you can see those top top corners sort of being sectioned out because of the trees? Yes, taken off the native bush. Yep. And there's gates into that. Uh, and also there's, I've got a reasonable size one paddock there so that the people, um, if they're going away, they can um, put the animals in a bigger paddock so they don't have the rotation Um they can set stock them a bit and also in winter time they can have the paddock nine for grazing and uh, go into paddock eight or if the, the water system uh, fails they can go into 11 and there's a dam there gotcha and that's Thank a, you. so that's a, yep okay next one is uh, okay uh, this is a favorite one of mine because um, the map on the left hand side is a map I give to um, fertilizer contractors and I color code the paddocks I want um, covered in uh, to spread on because that, that farm there had 44 paddocks or thereabouts and it had but I have four or five different fertilizer sections that I had indicated on the maps. So they had different you know, soil testing. They had different um, requirements for fertilizer. Now, um, they so each paddock was numbered at the gate, and each each uh, on the map is the same number. So they are less likely to make a mistake. And I can tell you a story about um, one time a contractor, not with this farm, but another one, contractor came on and uh, I gave him a map with a spreadsheet of all the details, which paddock, how much each paddock got of fertiliser and um, so forth like that. Uh, it was very well detailed out for him. Anyway, I had to go away that morning and I got back at lunchtime and I 
got a hold of the contractor and I said, how are you going? And he says, oh, I'm nearly finished. I said, no, it's impossible. It takes a day to do this. And he said, oh, no, no. I said, have you got putting it on the right rate or something? He said, no, I'm nearly finished. Anyway, um, it turned out that he wanted to get home early, so he put it on at three times the rate that it was supposed to. And um, his bosses weren't happy at all. I wasn't happy because I didn't get some paddocks fertilised um, when they were supposed to. And other paddocks got three times more than they should have. And they, um, the company was good about it. They had saved me $10,000. So it was well worthwhile having a good map and good um, instructions because I could show that um, all the stuff that really needed to be done. So that's a very handy tool, the mapping. Um, now, uh, different soil types, as we said, the water system and the contours and the topography we've covered before um, in the pastures. Okay, yeah, next one. Thanks, Lisa. Now, the water system. I know I keep going on about the water, but oh, it can be a nightmare. Um, if you don't set it up right, and I spent 25 years before we really, or 20 years before we really had a good water system. Um, and I can tell you a story of um, people, uh, clients that uh, borrowed actually $60,000 to put in a good water system. They had 2,000 acres or 2,500 acres, and um, they had a bore already but they put in a really good system, a two-inch water pipe um, up to a big storage tank up at the header, um, header tank. And when the drought came in the 18, 19 drought up in New South Wales, this was really bad drought, extremely bad. There was neighbours next door that didn't have, they ran out of water, they had to, uh, one neighbour, was buying some water in, but that he stopped doing that. He sold all stock, and another neighbour has reduced his herd considerably to eke out the water they did have. Whereas um, my client had a fantastic system, and uh, it didn't water was was not a problem for him. Uh, so that's uh, that's how important water can be uh, with the permanent. Now, you want permanent clean water. Now, uh, a real estate agent, if you're selling you the property, yeah, it's a permanent creek. Or they, you know, um, you so you've got to be very careful about that um, definition of permanent, particularly with climate change on the way, whether you believe it or not. It's certainly we're getting different seasons nowadays. Um, okay, now, uh, springs, it's really good to have a spring like we did on one of our farms, we had a spring up the top of the hill, not where the creek was down the bottom of the hill. It was about a 80 metre head. So we um, we could use that spring, but we had to increase the storage area we pumped from, from that spring. Um, but very valuable if you're lucky to have, lucky enough to have one, a really good one. Um, and I can't stress the bigger the better, like pipes particularly. Um, I used a inch and a half, um, sorry, an inch pipe when I should have used, inch and a quarter pipe when I should have used a two inch pipe to get up the last bit. And um, I had to rip that out and put a two inch pipe to get me right to the top tank properly. So don't hesitate putting it, I know it costs more money, but yeah, bigger the better. It goes for pumps. It goes for all sorts of things. Uh, now, system, you want the delivery system to be automated and pressurised if you can or um, a time on your pump to start up and fill the top tank, the uh, header tank or the pressurised system. It starts up when needed. Uh, monitored um, and particularly the troughs, stock proof. And if you are using dams, make sure, that I, once again, fenced off because if you're getting low on water in the dams, I've had stock 
stuck in dams and spend a fair bit of time pulling them out. And sheep, they can drown in it as well. That's even worse. Uh, from the drain, they get stuck in the mud, mud and they just can't get out. So uh, once again, fence them off and only put them in there when you let them in, if it's safe to do so. Okay, uh, now stock proof the troughs, and I mean stock proof. Make sure the uh, gate, the valve, water valve leading the water in is well and truly guarded. Um, whereas a lot of round troughs, they're not guarded properly. I personally like the coffin troughs. Um, we'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, um, and definitely have a pa uh, backup system for your pumps, um, the power, in other words, and um, as someone mentioned, a firefighting pump. I've used those for pumping water as well as a backup. Um, gate valves, um, make sure you've got the fittings and everything like that, and... But make sure you mark where your gate valves are. But put a bit of poly, uh, white poly in the ground sticking up next to the fence or something like that if that's where they are. And you can even um, GPS where the gate valves are, if you know how. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now, once again, I, I mentioned that you definitely have a different um, map for the homestead and surrounding buildings. Now, also, when we're talking water, you want to have um, all-weather tracks, if you can, track system. So that you can, and um, we found on my hobby farm that I bought, where one of the real ticks of the boxes in a wet air, you know, high rainfall area was that it had a gravel pit on it. It was a big help. Um, so you need to maintain your, uh, maintain your tracks because we're getting a lot more big storms nowadays that tend to wash things, wash things away. Okay. Now, uh, water source, that's the Bucken River there. Even during our worst drought we had on my memory, uh, that river stopped and it's a major river. Uh, it stopped and it had... We could still pump out of holes, but it, it stopped. And since then, we've fenced, that's been fenced off. The river's been fenced off. And um, the CMA actually took out all the willow trees, which caused um, even more erosion, unfortunately. Um, not too sure. There's a, Peter and a fellow called Peter Andrews who believes the more debris in it slows the water up is the better for the river systems and I'm, I'm I believe what I've seen what he's done and it's a good process to have um so I wish the CMAs would rethink their thoughts on that um, There's just a question come through could you quickly explain what a gravel pit is Malcolm oh gravel pit okay um it can be rocky or mine was sort of a sandy clay but once um, sandy clay and I was able to get it out and I had an old tipping trailer, I converted from a tipping truck um, and I was able to put my gravel on. Or oh, you can get contractors in to do it, which I ended up doing it at the one stage because I was too busy doing other people's consulting on other people's farms um, and they got the better equipment than I did and they take it out of the soil, um, the gravel pit, which is, uh, as I said, it can be sandy, uh, sandy things, or it can be um, rock, you know, uh, gravel rock, sort of loose rock. But so it, is this at, the lo at a low point on your property? No, no. There's or is on, it along the side of your laneways? No, you, this is for surfacing your laneways to make them all weather. Yep. Um, it's uh, what they... Well, the gravel, like you have on the roads, dirt roads, the gravel they have yep. on those. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, so use it for main maintain your laneways, but we'll talk about lane laneways a bit later on. But, um, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, now, uh, water sources can be also bores, as I said before, but there's a trough in the bottom right-hand corner. 
uh, trough. Um, that's a coffin trough. Now, they've got the cover off at the moment to check the ball. And the beauty, if you've got a small farm, you don't need a big trough because um, they don't have farm to, you know, they you don't have big mobs of cattle. Like dairy farms, they need to have a big trough because they've got a lot of animals going to at the one time. But your capacity doesn't have to be huge for small farms with small mobs of stock. Now, the coffin trough is also low enough uh, that, uh, generally speaking, lambs won't get drowned in it. I have lost lambs in round troughs before. They've jumped in and it's been too deep for them. And unfortunately, they've drowned. Um, I had to put rocks in the bottom so that they wouldn't do that. Um, but I really moved away from round troughs to coffin type troughs. Uh, having that lip around the bottom helps. They can put their front feet on and different classes like lambs, sheep and cattle, uh, lamb, uh, calves can get to the water. I've seen a lot of troughs whereby there's not been enough gravel put up around the troughs so that, um, you know, this is high troughs, so that um, people could... Um, I'm um, sorry, the animals uh, could get to the water, the calves, the small stock could, couldn't get to the water. And on a hot day, that could mean big problems for the calves and lambs and so forth. Um, so you've got to be very aware to make sure that the gravel, when there's not mud and so forth around the troughs. So once again, a gravel pit's handy uh, to make sure it's built up around the troughs. Um, yeah, and clean out your troughs on a regular basis. A handy thing for summertime if you get a bit of blue-green algae type stuff in there. Uh, and you can put goldfish in it. Um, they help to keep it clean. But you don't have goldfish in it. And then go and put what I recommend is a handful of copper sulfate in because it'll kill the, um, it will kill the goldfish pretty quickly. Okay, so um, copper sulfate's a handy thing for keeping them clean. Okay, now sighting your, thanks Lisa, sighting your troughs. Um, now with a small farm, this is a 50 acre farm here in front of you. Uh, you can sight them, so one in each paddock. Um, that's good. And you don't sight them too close to a fence. So put a, um, and you don't sight them near a gate because it's very, stock have a habit of running around troughs and it's very annoying to get them out of the paddock at times. Um, now on a small place, you can just put one trough in. If you've got a wagon wheel effect, you can just put it in the middle, like on the right hand side there um, with your fences um, or the one below, which is a wagon wheel effect effectively. Um, and you can just have one one water trough in there and that could do all any of those paddocks just one at a time if you're doing rotational grazing. And the 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 big uh the big map, uh, that farm there would be best to have um, a trough in divided in half, a trough at one end and a trough near the other end, um, uh, making sure it's there's plenty of room to get vehicles by and everything else like that. And you could just open up, as you're doing a, a rotational grazing, you can open up the paddocks to that trough as you go. Um, so that would save you a lot of troughs and piping and everything else. So uh, that's just a thought. Now, there's the water system on this one. Uh, see the, the thick line is the two inch up to the header tank. Uh, now with the, and this is what can be, um, as I said, need to fence off that dam. It's not fenced off. It's not safe for stock. Okay. Um, now vegetation. What have we got next after this one, Lisa? Oh, yeah. Now you can get uh, do your maps differently. Uh, this is done according to land class, and you can at that address there, email address, I'm um, sorry, on the Google you can get these um, land class table up 
and um, so that's basically uh, that's property here. Um, those areas in yellow are can be cultivated. The ones in brown are, um, are too steep for that. And then you've got the riparian area, which is along the creek or river or whatever it may be. It might be subject to flat uh, flooding or something like that. So uh, there's different land classes and you can look that up, the chart that goes with that map. But you can do those sorts of things on, on your mapping program. You can highlight various aspects of your farm. Next one, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, we mentioned soils before as regards type, if possible, definitely a soil test. And because the different soils need different management, even fertilizer and pasture species. Uh, pastures, we'll talk about that more, but as we've talked about some of that already. Uh, climate, once again, if you're new to the farm, at least spend at least four seasons um, and see how the farm normally is, what it's like in each season. Most, you know, it's very handy to have. In the case of East Gippsland, I'd say that's about 20 years before and you never get any normality in East Gippsland. So it depends on what it is, um, where you, what area you're in. Uh, South Gippsland, it's, it's, there's a normality. It's very reliable sort of weather um, climate. Now you do get extreme events anywhere you are, and we're getting more of the extreme uh, downpours, and it, it seems to be getting hotter. And the figures say that. Um, so what we call droughts, to me, it's just a norm. Um, you got to expect them. Uh, they will happen. Uh, so that's a consideration when you are setting up your farm, particularly for water and feed and such things as your containment areas. Okay, livestock suitability. Um, and that also goes for the type of stock suitable. If your climate, if you get like East Gippsland, I don't recommend people having any more than 40 50% of their stocking rate um, as breeding stock that you're not prepared to sell. And that's at the most. Um, and all the rest um, are stock that you might be trading or keeping animals on that you are prepared to sell. Because uh, you never know when you're going to get a drought. And um, a lot of people don't like selling their breeding herds, and we didn't. We had breeding stud, stud, stud animals we could not replace. Uh, if we sold them, we could not replace after the drought. So we paid very dearly, hundreds of thousands of dollars during some droughts um, to uh, for feed, bringing in feed and time and everything else, feeding stock. So it does have suitability on how you set your farm up and your stocking, what stock you have there, the class of stock. Made a big difference when we put sheep in. Yep, okay. Uh, thanks, Lisa. You're keeping me going. Um, so, therefore, you've got those things to consider. Now, risks. Okay, this is a big one. Um, I just talked about droughts. They are droughts. They're a certainty. They're not a risk or but they are um, a certainty. And that goes for floods. If you're if you're farming on a flood plain, that's a certainty. Floods are like um, droughts or dry seasons, right? Um, but number one is safety, as always, whether you're handling stock. So you set your equipment, uh, your infrastructure up, having the proper yards, which we'll talk shortly, uh, access, access trucks uh, tracks I had a very good friend of mine who um, is alive today because um, he had quick access to his house and get on the phone he nearly cut off his leg he cut his leg to a bone with a chainsaw and he had to get home quickly to the phone to get the ambulance um, and he's very lucky to be a driver um, 
and uh, he actually didn't have a laneway, sorry, he didn't have a laneway, he just put the four-wheel drive through the gates, bashed through the gates. Now, if you had a quick access, you know, that would have been even quicker, less risk. Okay, um, now with the droughts, of course, you can put infrastructure in like containment areas, and by having a good pasture management system, uh, with the containment areas, you're able to um, keep that ground cover on for quick recovery when you get rain. Fires, um, they're more than a risk in Australia, um, and particularly if you're near bush, it's a higher risk than not. Um, so there's plenty of things that you can do for that, uh, to do with homesteads, uh, your buildings and so forth and um, with the infrastructure as well as your vegetation uh, and containment areas again. Uh, water, we've talked about a lot. Uh, there's a risk of breakdown and loss of water. Uh, money, uh, that's always a risk of running out of money. So manage the money, but uh, uh, stress, uh, money stress certainly affects the safety and well-being and one of the key principles, enjoyment of the farm. So if you're having money stress, have a real full review of your whole situation. Uh, and uh, rural financial counsellors are really good people to get onto over there. Okay, erosion. You've got to watch out for your drainage on your laneways and yards and everything else. Um, you've got to worry about pest and plant, pest animals and plants because if you've got pest um, plant, uh, plants on the place like blackberries and so forth, they're good for rabbits. Um, even wombats can cause erosion, can cause erosion in your dam walls. Uh, it can also, uh, your rabbits can cause tunnel erosion. Um, I've seen that plenty of times, so um, that's your pest animals. Um, so what you can do about the course is fencing out your pest animals and um, get rid of your pest plants. Um, easy said, of course. Takes a long time. Uh, okay, biosecurity is handy. We've talked about that before. Um but their yeah, biosecurity uh, is becoming an increasing threat and uh, the risk of that coming on the infrastructure such as a uh, uh, exclusion fencing on the boundary can be a big help uh, from that point of view stop wild pigs coming in deer and um, pest animals such or invasive animals such as too many kangaroos Okay, so that's all about the infrastructure there. Um, another thing is your monitoring equipment for theft and trespass and vandalism. And particularly if you're a small farm, um, but not only for small farms, uh, quite often quads get went missing in the old days, but uh, ATVs and other equipment like that. We had a neighbour lost two uh, quads, um, but... The local policeman, it was two o'clock in the morning, thought this was a bit suspicious and pulled the people up. So that's, uh, that was handy. <laughs> um, okay, next one, thanks. Just have a question. I'm very aware of time. I've, we've got about 20 minutes left, but Is someone. <laughs> I'm, having a, I'm having a ball here. I'm sorry for boring people. <laughs> We'll keep people here all night answering questions. Okay. Um, someone someone mentioned here fencing, and we're moving on to fencing now, so I thought it would be relevant. Um, fencing for keeping your animals in, but wildlife to be able to move in and out of. Yeah, okay. Um, I have got that there down the gateways for wombats on this slide. So, yep, I'll touch on that shortly. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Um, and exactly what your question was about, to keep things in and out, in and or out. That's what fencing's for. Um, okay, it also, um, yeah, a good boundary fence 
makes for good neighbours. And you, you're unlucky if you've got, in a lot of ways, if you've got a um, government bush as a neighbour. So that, that that's a real headache. Um, but, yeah, it, it will give you good neighbours if you've got good fences, usually. Uh, but fences need to be built right, and that is for easy maintenance, for longevity, and to do what they're meant to do. Um, now, there's um, plenty of different types of fencing from the point of view of what you're wanting to do with them. Uh, gateways uh, for stock and vehicles, and wombats. Now, uh, I'll put that in if you want wombats to come onto your place. Um, you can have a little swing gate with a frame around it that will let them in, but won't let the bigger animals in. Uh, wombats will, they're, they're like little bulldozers. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll show you. Next slide, thanks. But um, you've got uh, the different types of fencing. There's a exclusion fence for wombats and um, on the right-hand side there, You've got, um, it's not the 1.8 metres high, which you need as a full exclusion fence. That, that will tend to keep deer out because deer can jump like, they can jump better than kangaroos really. Um, and I've seen a kangaroo jump over a six foot fence. Um, yeah, by the time he left the ground, it was nearly six foot high. Um, and that was from a standing start. He was a big roo. Uh, but that apron is very important for keeping out um, rabbits. Oh, well, that, that's not a rabbit-proof fence, but um, keeping out wombats and wild pigs. And a lot of kangaroos actually go under the fence or through a fence. They don't. The big ones will jump over easily, but if they're young ones, um, one um, can't follow. They, the big ones tend to go off with the young ones somewhere else to some other farm. They haven't got the exclusion fencing in. Now, on that fence, uh, there's a hot wire on the top. I do not recommend that. What I do recommend is um, like the middle photograph, but down at, um, say, 30 centimetres from the ground, a hot wire on both sides of the fence. Uh, sorry, on the outside of the fence. Now, you may have to talk to your neighbour if you're going to be putting a boundary fence in and the and the uh, apron's got to be on the outside of your fence, otherwise they just push underneath it anyway. But, um, yeah, so I do suggest you have a hot wire to stop them putting any pressure. Have an outrigger on the inside at 50 to 60 um, centimetres high from the ground, and that will keep stock off the fence. It will stop um, shedding sheep, for example, rubbing on those fences. They love to do that. Um, and it will uh, preserve your fence. It will also stop them um, pushing through. Okay. Now, the top that top wire, you'll get shorting out. Now, you can do the... Um, okay, we've got to, got to keep going. Sorry. Okay, so we'll get on to a favourite subject for most farmers, and I don't think I've ever seen two yards the same. Um, now, this one here, um, siding the yard's important. You want to basically level ground, and um, and you want to have the drainage going from the middle of the yards out. Drainage is very important. You don't like, it's not fun walking in um, boot-high mud, particularly if it's sticky mud. Uh, so you want good drainage. Uh, there's plenty of designs out there, uh, holding paddocks, and you want a holding paddock to have the stock in. Uh, once again, a containment area um, or a holding bigger holding paddocks that can be just ring lock. They don't have to be panels and so forth. Uh, that yard there I built, um, it's a timber one, but it's... Um, it's got cable in between those two rails, just in case you're wondering. Um, okay, um, laneways, make sure your laneways are uh, appropriate and your gateways. 
wider the gate you can have going into the yards, the better. They are 12 or 14 foot gates in some instances. Um, don't, do not recommend ever having two gates. Uh, it just It's too hard to manage. Um, and I don't recommend having water troughs in yards. You have them in the holding paddocks adjacent to the yards. And But I do like to have shade. Just you've got to watch out for the shadows. Um, but, yeah, uh, now you can. Okay, we can go to the next. This is sheep yards. Uh, it's the same for the cattle yards. Basically, you build them so that they are safe to use for both man and beast or uh, humans and beast. Uh, it's very important that. Um, it's not much fun if you're injured. You can't have fun farming. Uh, now, stock generally love to go around corners because they see their mates disappearing around the corner. They want to follow. And uh, always do that um, as best you can. I don't like corners. Uh, work with small groups. So bring your mob into the holding paddocks and then take them out in working workable size areas. Don't try to jam everything in cattle. Uh, stock don't flow as well. Um, we mentioned shade, dust. And, okay, next one, please. Okay, this is cattle yards. Um, of course, the animals are bigger. Um, and I don't recommend dogs in yards, but some people have got very well-trained dogs and can do that with cattle in yards, but they're usually big properties and have bigger yards. Uh, the one on the left is was uh, developed from Rubber Glen Research Station with thousands of cattle going through yards, and that's what that previous yard that I built, the wooden yard I built, uh, is the main working area is built from there uh, to that exact copy just about. Um, now the wooden yard in the in the top right hand side there is an example of a very dangerous yard and very inefficient for stock movement. There's no fun working with cattle in yards like that. I don't care how quiet they are. Um, one animal can get a fright and push another animal onto you or whatever. So um, I do not recommend that. And I, I like to cut the corners off in yards. As you can see here, I've cut the corners off. So animals don't put their heads in there and bum to you. Now, the bottom yards is one um, I had. That was Buckham, a dry, you know, basically dry climate. And down the bottom is our... We had a, a bought an old dairy farm and had a, a, a shed which we converted into stockyards. So it was fantastic to be able to live and we weren't uh, working in mud um, at times. And um, yes, yeah, so that's a roof can be handy, but it's once again, it's a cost. It's also nice and shady in the hot day. Okay, laneways. Uh, Gee, I love laneways. It took me 20 years to put in a laneway in that 2,000 acre farm. Um, and we never looked back. The kids, you know, young kids could go up and muster the stock and have them in the, sh in the shearing shed ready for shearing without having to go through two or three paddocks uh, to get them there. So um, it was really handy. Just uh, do it sooner rather than later. They do cost a bit of money, but they're uh, invaluable. Um, they are gateways, uh, don't scrimp on the gateways if you can, at least 12 foot or 3.6 metres, preferably bigger. And particularly if you've got um, access for trucks, you may, in those instances, use um, 16 footers or even two gates if necessary. But um, you've got to watch out for access for those. And once again, on the gateways, you put your your paddock numbers, the big yellow, huge big yellow ear tags you can get, you can write them on. Uh, stock containment area is fantastic. I, I live by these things because you can use them when your country is even too wet. The paddocks are too wet, you want to get the stock off them so they don't bog it up. You can put them in a containment area, which is uh, well-drained and uh, got shade. 
uh, and water and shelter. Um, it's uh, certainly really good for grazing management and um, sa um, saving your paddocks for better growth recovery. Uh, and also you can use it for quarantine. When you buy animals on the place, it's really great to get them into there so you can quarantine them and also training weaning stock and stock you buy onto the farm. You can train them through the yards every day for a week and have them just running, um, sorry, walking through the yards, not running, walking through the yards, through the race, through the headlock without catching them, not doing any treatments on them, just getting them used to and then have the feed out into the containment area so they're walking back onto feed. And um, that, it's a really good tool, very good, very handy tool to have. Okay. Next one, thanks. Homestead, yep, everyone wants a good view. Um, everyone wants a good view, but if you don't like, like my wife, doesn't like wind, um, it's good to get on the leeward side of a, a hill, if you can, um, with a good view. Um, and uh, but you also got to be careful. Um, the trees you plant around a homestead, you don't want a bush, native bush around your homestead. You can put English deciduous trees or um, evergreen trees um, but uh, that are more of a fire retardant than native uh, plants. Um, so it's a consideration. Uh, good water, we didn't have a good water uh, system for our house for 20 years, 25 years, and uh, it was a constant problem. Okay, um, nowadays you can have off-grid as well as uh, mainstream power. And people, a lot of people coming from the city don't know about the water system and they don't know about uh, septic tanks. <laughs> so be aware where your septic tank is and so forth like that. Okay, um, sheds, make sure you've got the opening to uh, the east or north or any, anything in between so you don't get cold, wet, prevailing winds coming in. I've seen one where the wind hits, uh, the rain hits the back wall of the, the machinery shed. Not much good. Um, okay. Uh, have a lock-up area. I know it, it won't keep most people out, but it, you know you've been robbed if um, if you see your rock lock has been cut off. Um, and now I have an approved uh, chemical section. Okay. Um, so for your, all your chemicals, not usually in the shed, usually separate from the shed. I don't suggest you have it in your shed, not the closed end area anyway. Um, okay, now getting onto vegetation, this is just an example. Um, it was just a bare paddock, virtually didn't have any vegetation on it. And actually this person wanted to run chooks. Um, as well as sheep and um, so plenty of shelter put the trees in the green areas i like cutting off corners and um, it's cheaper on fencing and also it gives stock a chance to get around on a different angle than where depending on where the sun is or the wind okay um, i don't like putting native trees on big native trees like blue gums or something like that on the fence lines they drop branches Back the fences. Um, vegetation definitely suit, um, it suits the environment. There's a lot of um, trees or two, but uh, okay. Um, once again, you can put in deciduous trees like this one here on the driveway. That's uh, ornamental pear trees, which we've got some in the backyard here. They're very hardy, but they are very colourful along the driveway. Um, and the deciduous, and I actually don't mind deciduous trees. Uh, we used to plant deciduous uh, desert ash along the fence lines because they didn't drop branches, and in winter time they drop their leaves onto the the paddocks, and they um, also let light into along the fence line. So that was good. Um, okay, don't forget to manage to any plants you've got fenced off from weeds. And pest animals. Um, 
okay and you can plant trees in the rocky areas and they're all steep in the gullies and so forth which are not productive but yeah okay help the environment tremendously that's just of our farm at our home farm at Bucken. Uh, just planted these trees you see in the bottom photographs um, in 2005 and 10 years later they're on the left hand side and um, that's the only th and on the right hand side in 2023 that was but that was after the fires in 2019 which burnt everything on the farm except for the homestead and those trees that I planted there um yeah so and they weren't uh they weren't um native trees up along the drive they were millias uh, white cedars supposed to be australia's only deciduous trees but anyway that's those okay that's just vegetation where i've cut it off the corners and uh, so forth and cut off the native vegetation which we talked about before yep next one Good pastures. Well, we'll be talking about pastures next time. We're running out of time, so we can talk about pastures next time. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to develop your infrastructure, your fencing, and so forth for, for maximum gra best grazing systems. Yep, go on. next one. Okay, there's. Um, I don't know about you, but I've I've uh, got a lot of experience with prograze organic farming biodynamics and regenerative agriculture but I still come back to the basic principles they're all the same and there's get them onto your pasture eat them and get them off as quick as you can to aid for the recovery of the plant um, now um, regenerative agriculture is talking a lot about um, uh, microbes in the soil well 50, 50 years ago we were putting microbes in the soil with, with biodynamics um, the Department of Agriculture has just in the last 10 years or so have um, recognised that there's microbes that help you <laughs> in the soil. And we'll be, we'll be going into this a little bit more detail in webinar six. So the final webinar will be talking a lot on this. So just keeping that in mind. Yeah, great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Next one. Thanks. Okay. Electricity. That's uh, really great. Makes life easier. Uh, yeah, you want to have backup electric fence system if you can. Um, we used to have two on the big farm. We used to have two um, units, um, and if one failed, which lightning hit one once, um, I can just put a plug in and uh, switch, and um, one unit will do the lot. Um, electric pylons, um, electric lines. You want to have them marked on your map, for example. If you've got aerial planes putting in fertilizer or uh, spraying, um, you don't want them to hit those lines. But uh, pylons, we've had uh, had a farm with big pylons like in that photograph on it. Um, okay, now internet, once again, uh, check out your farm where you got the strength, sig not single strength, <laughs> signal strength is supposed to be. Uh, but yeah, okay, we're going to finish up with um, the driveway, which is the entrance to the farm and tracks, but uh, driveway, uh, I'm a great believer in actually having a good entrance that has clearly got the name of the farm and the number, the uh, address number on it very clearly thing. But in case of emergency and in case of um uh, service people and or friends it's much easier to find and just on that um the communication internet mobile phone I've, I've had a few people say there's dead zones within their property where they don't get any reception it's good if that's the case to have a radio on you so long range or something that you can communicate with someone else on the property if i guess you do get into an accident that yeah. um a, you UH, a that. uhf is handy yeah yeah um, because, yeah, uh, that is handy. But oh, that'll tell someone yeah, that you're going out to that particular paddocks. Once again, it's handy to have the numbers. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. 
So I won't go over these again, but yeah, um, definitely that actions for you to, I, what I think with the action circle, I'd like to put in the word action after between plan and review. It's missing the word plan in there, um, to, to actions, put actions in. So the next webinar, we need to <laughs> put that in there. Um, no use planning. If you don't action your plan, it's a waste of time. And I've had clients just put my reports in their, in their drawers and not do anything about them. Um, yeah, so don't forget the principles to work by. Okay, next one. And it's much easier to use your head to achieve what your heart desires. It took me 20 years or 20 odd years to learn that the hard way. Okay, next. Okay, now my favourite subject is we're getting onto the animals. I'm a real animal person. Um, okay, so that's what we're going to be covering. Um, Perhaps not all that, and not all that in de uh, We won't be doing too much detail because um, each one of those sections could be a day workshop or a week workshop. <laughs> um, so we'll be going and through. Mal Malcolm, you mentioned that you wanted to send out a question about people's livestock and what they want for webinar three. Yes. Um, yes. Um, very true. Yep. If um, if you could do a bit of work before the next webinar um, and answer those questions, if Lisa would be so kind to send you out along with the information on Friday. Um, and if you can spend the weekend, um, yeah, just going over that and just filling in those questions, I'll be pretty quick to answer. That would be very much appreciated. Know who I'm talking to because it's awkward not having faces and people to actually but these are just the resources that you said might be helpful when you're thinking about planning or doing that infrastructure yeah um i think you mentioned not on this one but on the next slide um that contour map that we've added in here so just on the last one of farm plans management and monitoring there's that department of land interactive contour map that you reference which i think would be pretty useful. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, it is handy for those um, those features like contours and um, that sort of stuff here, yeah. and even water uh, availability of water bores and that sort of stuff. Yep, yeah. which you need yeah. permits for. You even need a permit for dams making. You need, you need a permit for everything nowadays. Uh, you you can clean out your dams without a permit. Beautiful. So I, I think... find most of my clients clean out their dams. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. So that's. Yes. Um, Paul just said, are we able to access this in prior webinars? Yes. I'll be sending you the YouTube link. So everything from previous webinar, this one, and all the future webinars will be recorded and sent to you so you can access them later. So they go up on our YouTube channel and we send that to you. So I think that's, that's it for, for this session. Um, we look forward to next week. So uh, next Wednesday, same time, 6 p.m., we'll be covering all that, um, I guess, what you do when you want to buy your animals and what you should be looking out for and looking forward to that. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending and giving your time this evening. Um, if you have any questions that um, we couldn't answer, uh, shoot us an email and um, we'll we'll get Malcolm to ask, answer it next time or maybe we can shoot you an email back to answer it on the spot. So thank you so much for giving your time tonight and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Bye, Malcolm. All. Bye all. Happy farming.